Dada. Dada. Some words seize the imagination and draw you in, inviting you to delve deeper. For me, Dada is just one of those words. An idea, a call to arms, and a way of thinking. OK, ready. Here we go. We're going to embark on a journey. I'm going to take you, dear viewer, to a place where no television programme has ever been before. But, but no, what I am going to do is try and persuade you that Dada is much, much more than an obscure art movement with a funny name. Oh, yes. 100 years ago, in the midst of a nonsensical war, Dada made an art out of the absurd. Mocking politicians, satirising the media, and ridiculing centuries of culture, Dada created a new way of looking at the world. Sometimes shocking, often anarchic, and always difficult to define, its legacy would span a century. Dada's tentacles have spread right across our culture. From punk to the Pythons, and from Damien Hirst to David Bowie. The world has gone gaga for Dada. Do you want me to shout Dada now? No. Everybody's heard of Dada, but no one seems to know exactly what it is. Dada takes delight in contradiction. So, to help me pin it down, I've enlisted the help of a few friends. Dada! Dada! Dada, 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 dada. And, with their assistance, I'll be recreating some Dada performances. Uh -huh. Destroying some artworks... <laughs> ...and pulling some mischievous stunts. There's my Dadaist act for the day. And all of this to establish why, out of all the isms, movements and manifestos of the 20th century, it was the Dadaists who proved the most important. Giving birth not only to a lot of modern art, but also shaping comedy, music, and political protest. I first came across Dada at art school in the early 80s. It was funnier and more anarchic than anything else I'd discovered, and it didn't always have to make sense. I soon embarked on nonsensical performances of my own. I did a performance called I Kestrel, where I dropped potatoes from out of a cardboard box. I was in a band that had no name, but we smelt of curry. It emerged from flasks at the side of the stage. Some people have called some of my performances Dada-esque, and they've certainly always flown in the face of logic, leading me to think... Have I been subconsciously influenced? Hmm. Maybe. <laughs> but where did all this Dadaism begin? Was is Dada? Kie Dada? What is Dada? Dada, a word chosen at random from a French-German dictionary. Yes, yes, in Romanian. A hobby horse in French. Whatever the case, it all began a hundred years ago in an unlikely place. It wasn't in Berlin or Paris, or any of your usual hotbeds of bohemian outrage. No. The first artists to scare the hell out of the establishment launched their revolution here, in, of all places, Zurich. <laughs> when you think of Zurich, the last thing you think about is a radical anarchic art movement. What you might think about is cheese, clocks, Oh, Swiss army knives, but a radical art movement, no. But it was exactly that, there's nothing to see here, reputation, that staying in neutral whilst the neighbours were all fighting to the death that made Zurich the breeding ground for Dada. In 1916, Europe was tearing itself apart. 
and some wanted no further part in the madness and destruction they saw around them. Amidst the violence and upheaval of the First World War, artists, poets and free thinkers from both sides of the conflict gathered here in Zurich to avoid the horrors of the battlefront. It was a city of exiles, and among them, a group of unlikely revolutionaries formed a bizarre protest movement, Dada. In a world where governments created carnage and the normal order had become nonsensical, the Dadais felt the only appropriate artistic response was to be truly and deliberately absurd. And like all the best world-changing movements, Dada began here in a dirty, dingy underground drinking hole. With nothing more than the humble dream of selling extra sausages and beer, the proprietor of this place sanctioned a cabaret. Little did he know what he was letting himself in for. The Cabaret Voltaire, still here a hundred years on, kick-started a movement that would wreak havoc across Europe and beyond. So welcome, Jim, to Cabaret Voltaire, the Thank birthplace you, of Dada. Cheers. So how did the Cabaret Voltaire start here then? Hugo Ball, who was a, a writer and a director in a theatre in Munich, and Emmy Hennings, who was a singer in, in cafes and, and bars. They came here in 1915 and they were hired in a, in a cabaret just down the street. And after a while they, they thought we should have our own cabaret. They sent out an invitation to artists. Was there any kind of direction or it was just do whatever you want to do? Today one would say it was an open stage. A free for all. Yeah, free for yeah. all. So the Dardais mobilised themselves for war, but theirs was a battle against reason itself. Hugo Ball appeared in a bizarre bishop's outfit. Romanian poet Tristan Zara cast a Maori tribal spell. Swiss artist Sophie Tauber improvised a dance wearing a cardboard mask. And a dozen balalaika players turned up. The German poet Richard Holzenbeck snapped a riding whip, shouting, Pig's bladder, kettle drum, cinnabar, crew, crew, crew. And was joined by Tristan Zara and Marcel Janko to perform in German, English and French all at the same time. Sounds like a great show. Well, a bit of a shock for the locals. What sort of a people did they attract in here then? It's people who come to drink beer and eat sausages. And, and absinthe. And absinthe, yeah. Yeah. And they didn't come to to see somebody talking about art or reciting poems. Yeah. Basically, they had to be better than the absinthe or better than beer and sausages. This really reminds me of where I started off. I started off in a, in a pub in South East London, yeah. which was about the same size as this, the mm -hmm. same layout, and it was the same kind of thing. I used to get people out of the audience yeah. and say, do you want to do something? And it would be a different show every week. And it was just like strangely so similar. So did you have some absinthe at that time, maybe? We didn't have absinthe, that's why no, it, we it just happened. had lager. Lager. <laughs> <laughs> For Hugo Ball, language had been hijacked by the warmongers who twisted words to justify their violent acts. So out went words and in came some unusual poetry. A lot of these words, they're made up, aren't they? Bloiko. I could say that in my accent. Bloiko. Bloiko. That's nice, yeah. Ogrogu. What is it? Uh, the umflout? It's not it's an umflout. Ogrogu. What's this? Bula men. I think you can probably get that in a face cream. <laughs> Some of those words may feel a bit familiar. Over. Well, look, the audience is in, and we're ruining it for them, really, by still being here, so we should make a dramatic entrance. Yes. Um, very soon. Tonight, I'm going to be restaging one of the founding moments in the history of Dada, here at its birthplace. For Hugo Ball's most iconic performance, he wore his most outlandish outfit. So we'll try and fit uh, Jim into Hugo's costume. Oh, pull it off. You misjudged my bulk. There's a few serious faces in the audience. God knows what they're going to make of my transformation into Hugo Ball. How's that? The words don't make any sense. I know. There's only one word. <laughs> don't try and understand. You know what we're going to do? 
Go with the flow. Right, start because my okay. specs are falling off my nose with the sweat. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Elefanto l'imbrusso la bulo membrusso la bulo mentrombata Velo da man banda falo purza mai a falo purza mai lenga do to I'm getting lost Gaga di bumbalo bumbalo gaja men Gaga di bling blong Gaga blong I'm collapsing. Take this off. <laughs> Thank you. And there we are. Um, what was that? <laughs> His outfit was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not knocking it at all. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm right on it. If he's there doing his poetry in his magic bishop's costume, he's already got a congregation, so he's begun a religion. Yeah, and so that's why all these people come here, like pilgrimage. And what a great shrine. What a yeah. fantastic place. If you're going to have a religion, I'm going to be in here. Yeah. <laughs> Hugo Ball wrote that Everyone has been seized by an indefinable intoxication. The little cabaret is about to come apart at the seams and is getting to be a playground for crazy emotions. Are you following me? Just five months after it opened, the cabaret closed. But Dada was just beginning. In July 1916, Hugo Ball delivered the first in a series of speeches announcing the Dada Manifestos. These speeches parodied the more grandiose written manifestos of the time. Dada is a new tendency in art. How does one achieve eternal bliss by saying Dada? How does one become famous by saying Dada? A line of poetry is a chance to get rid of all the filth that clings to this accursed language. As if put there by a stockbroker's hands, Hands worn smooth by coins. Dada is the heart of words. So what were they doing, let's say, with the poetry, the meaningless, pointless, senseless words within the poetry? Was it a reaction against the meaningless, senseless, pointless war that was surrounding them? Or were they just trying out something new and having fun with it? I don't know. Do you know? In neighbouring Germany, Life was becoming increasingly desperate as the war drew to a close. And nowhere was this more so than in Berlin. This devastated city would provide the setting for Dada's new incarnation as the German poet Richard Holzenbeck returned home from Zurich. Richard Holzenbeck wound up the crowd claiming the Zurich Dadaists were pro-war. And Dadaism is still pro-war today. Things are still not cruel enough. In Berlin, Club Dada would unleash a fiercely political rage. The first international Dada fair shook Berlin with its shocking satire of the German establishment. And it didn't just tease the establishment, it mercilessly mocked the powers that be. John Hartfield hung a dummy from the ceiling dressed in German military uniform and with a pig's snout for a face. And Otto Dix showed veterans disabled by war injuries. These artists took genuine risks and many were arrested for their actions. But in the male-dominated world of Berlin Dada, Hülsenbeck, Hartfield and Dix met their match in Hannah Hock. More than holding her own at the art fair, Hock satirised the entire German establishment with her masterpiece, Cut with the Kitchen Knife, pioneering a radically subversive new art form, Photomontage. Dada's groundbreaking visual techniques would have a huge impact on Neville Brody, one of the pioneers of modern graphic design. His interest in Dada has seeped into his cutting-edge art direction for the Face magazine and his iconic post-punk sleeve designs for bands like you guessed it, 
Cabaret Voltaire. Neville, here we've got an early bit of photo montage by Hannah Hock. That's the Kaiser, isn't it? So is this, this is his moustache. Well, yeah. this is what I like about it, yeah. Oh, it's two wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got little Hannah Hock down here, this tiny head as a kind of signature. And then these are the countries where women had the right to vote at the time. This is the first real kind of powerful use of photo montage as a real tool of subversion. Why was it? Was it because you've got photos in newspapers? The free access of, of like printed photographs meant that someone like Hannah Hock could come in, cut it out, combine it all and create a completely new narrative. So this is a whole new way of looking. It's like a big political cartoon as well, isn't it? Yeah. This was shocking to the bourgeoisie. It was deliberately non-aesthetic. It's not pretty. And this is something that we've seen a lot since. Um, you know, punk, Jamie Reed, the, the Sex Pistols covers. I wanna destroy my punk hijacked Dada's use of photo montage as a weapon of subversion. From Jamie Reed's Sex Pistol covers to Linda Sterling's feminist artworks and sleeve designs for bands like the Buzzcocks. But punk is only the most obvious child of Dada. Club Dada's striking visuals extended to magazines and journals. I've brought along a copy of the first Dada publication and I've got a feeling this is going to be right up Neville Street. What is this? This is coming directly out of the photo montage approach, but now it's, it's typo montage. Yeah, so we're using, using everything. This is really stunning. It's an amazing piece of freeform typography. This really was ahead of its time. It just looks incredibly modern. There was a lot of punk stuff that was done that looked like this. Um, a lot of art in the 60s and 70s had this feel and yeah. 50s. And it's had a big influence on my work directly. The idea of going off grid, nothing lines up, it's all at an angle. Um, yeah, it has so much energy. It is completely haphazard. Yeah. I actually remember I did a whole record cover all the tight was at angles. Yeah. And the printer helped me by straightening them all up again. <laughs> and said, I've fixed it for you now, young man. This is beautiful though, isn't it? It's gorgeous. Just an extraordinary piece. Makes me wanna what? gonna give up. It's all been done really, hasn't it? <laughs> A lot of today's generation of graphic designers think they're nicking ideas from Neville Brody, but what they don't realise is that some of the freshest looking magazine layouts date back to Dada. While Hannah Hock and others were busy setting the agenda for 20th century culture, one lone wolf managed to grab all of the world's media attention. Architect Johannes Bader was in his own Dada universe. He called himself Super Dada, or Dada Cheap, and announced himself as President of the Earth. No ego problems there, then. On April Fool's Day, he warned the district of Berlin that Dada forces were on their way, and 2,000 people were there to fend off the Dada invasion. When the time came, he wrote his own obituary, but announced his resurrection the following day. Richard Hulsenbeck warned... Watch out for Bada, who has nothing to do with our thoughts. He has compromised Dada in Berlin to such an extent with his idiocies that I can't even get a small item into the press. According to one of the Dada gang, Dada was a dancing epidemic with simultaneous beginnings in different parts of the world. In Zurich, Dada had taken a hammer to language. In Berlin, it attacked the political establishment. And now, in New York, Dada took aim at art itself. Marcel Duchamp, the king of conceptual art, forced the grand old guardians of the art world to ask themselves a question they hadn't had to think about before. If you put a toilet in an art gallery, does that make it art? And should I start stroking my beard yet? Duchamp caused scandal by presenting a urinal signed Armut to the board of the Society for Independent Artists. It was rejected and the story went in Dada journals like The Blind Man. It was just one in a series of ready-mades. Everyday objects exhibited as art. A closed window. A snow shovel. 
a bottle rack, and a bicycle wheel. And Duchamp provoked the rage of the art establishment still further by defacing an old master. A copy, at least. He called the work El Achot au Cool, which in French sounds just like she's got a hot ass. For the Dadaists, this series of provocations was enough for Duchamp to gain entry into their club, whether he liked it or not. Artist Cornelia Parker has made art out of everyday objects herself, but not without flattening them first with a steamroller. She's my kind of artist. And for Cornelia, Duchon, the reluctant dadist, has been a lifelong inspiration. Was Marcel Duchon a dadaist? He was a dadaist by default, I think. Toilet, ah, Mutt's toilet, that's Armut's the thing toilet. everyone knows. Yeah, I suppose he introduced the idea of anything you could just go and buy in the shop becoming an art object. And he did, and he caused a big stink. He did. The idea of putting that into a salon where you're supposed to put ex accepted work seemed to be what it was all about, really, more than the object itself. A lot of things just started with him because he was just up for anything. Duchamp sort of opened up this seam, you know, in, in kind of art that was... You know, everything was quite stable and quite you know, progressing nicely, but he just kind of created this big fissure, you know, this fault line that uh, allowed other people just to be complete, completely maverick. Duchamp's idea for the ready-made has inspired generations of artists since, and at the time inspired a collaboration with artist and photographer Man Ray. Well, this is fantastic photograph by Man Ray of Duchamp's half-finished sculpture, um, which was called The Large Glass. He was allowing dust to, to accumulate on it because he wanted to incorporate the dust into the piece. And I think he left a note for the cleaning because he had a cleaning lady saying, you know, don't, don't touch dust breathing. <laughs> Did Man Ray come round to his, his house? And then uh, Marcel, it and Marcel like said, it. hey, yeah, look at this. <laughs> look at all this dust I'm breeding here. And he said, well, let's take a picture of it, shall I? I'm sure it's something like that. I, bet I, it is, I isn't think it? Some, some of the best art is serendipitous. I quite like the idea of, you know, ne negligence <laughs> becoming art. <laughs> yeah. And have you been influenced by Dada? I'm very influenced by Duchamp. I think he's most probably had to pick one artist to say that he's had the most influence on me. Yeah. Dada managed to be really infantile and outrageous, but at the same time made people think about things afresh. I'm off with Cornelia to stage our own Dada intervention. It'll pay tribute to both the politics of Club Dada in Berlin and the irreverence of New York Dada. It's taking us to Bond Street, where war leaders Churchill and Roosevelt hold court. Theo gets arrested first. Do you think I'll get arrested more likely to get arrested with Balaclavas? I think you'll get more arrested than me. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a boy. Right, so, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. There's my Dardaist act for the day. That's great, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> Extremely menacing. <laughs> Must we leave on for a couple of minutes, see what people think. I think Cornelia's gone for Politico Dada. She's made them into terrorists. And the police don't seem to have noticed yet. Right, now it's my turn to give these old geezers a 21st century facelift. I'm thinking Absurdo Dada is more my style. I should bring him down to scale. Yeah. Well, that's great, I love it. <laughs> Whose knee do you want, darling? I think I've got an ear. <laughs> what does it mean then? What, what have we mean? done? What well, have we done? I mean, this is almost, a, well, it's 100 years after Dardaism, so this is. Uh, is it a student prank? I think it's a student prank. It kind of feels like it. It is a student prank, isn't it? I liked your um, balacarvas, I think, best. Did you? Yeah. It was more of a striking it's, effect. It's slightly more edgy. People will enjoy this one more, I think. Mine was most probably a bit more like, you know, like Pussy Riot or something. Do you think so? Yes. Oh, here come the coppers. 
What should we do? Just leave it there? No, we could. <laughs> just walk off and leave it. <laughs> I suppose there's a whole legacy of Dar that means that people have been defacing statues for a long time, haven't they? So usually the traffic yeah. cone is the favourite one. Now you've got Banksy. It's not just been cheap. <laughs> no. No, it's been more, I don't know, it came out of a more political time, didn't it? For some, some reason I always thought Dadaism was a little, a little less benign than surrealism. Well, that's its brilliance for me. Dada can be the provocative, dangerous art form Cornelia is drawn to, but it's also the original inspiration for mindless student pranks. Here we go, 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 go. Back in Zurich, Tristan Zara, who we last saw casting a tribal spell at the Cabaret Voltaire, was taking Dada in a radical new direction. With new publications springing up by the second, Dada's next target was the world of mass communication. Zara planned to trick the papers with a fake press release. Zara was using Dada's subversive energy to mock the new media culture. There was a pistol duel yesterday on the Rehalp near Zurich between Tristan Zara, familiar founder of Dada, and Dada painter Hans Zarp. Four rounds were fired, and in the fourth exchange, Arp was slightly grazed on his left thigh. Armando Iannucci, how do you respond to this? <laughs> well, this is literally news to me. Yeah, I'm uh, going to put the hands down. I'm going to stop doing this. This was um, an article. This was written by the Dadaists and sent out to various publications, newspapers, and was, was printed. Mm -hmm. It was all made up. It was fake. And that is something that is very um, uh, contemporary because nowadays, you know, there's so much, you know, 24-hour media and newspapers that have websites that need filling. So if you sent them a press release now, yeah. it will appear as a story, even though it's word for word quoting the press release that you've sent out. I mean, what Dada is saying is that something that sounds very serious and true might not be serious and might not be true. I remember we, about 20 years ago, we did a show called On The Hour, and, um, which was like a false news programme, but we actually did a... We made a report about an abattoir where the cows were actually rising from the dead. I remember it. Was, it. And, and, <laughs> and it nearly got on the Today programme. We submitted it as from a Bristol reporter for BBC Bristol, and. And, jo and it was all lined up, and John Humphreys had written his introduction and everything, and we came seconds away from it being played live. Armando Iannucci has made an art out of Dadaist manipulation with shows like The Day Today. News. London Transport say they may have to close the underground system due to an infestation of horses. A report described the conditions in the equine plague as like an abattoir in a power cut. To inspire other would-be Dadaists, Tristan Zara published a set of instructions on how to tear up newspaper articles and reassemble them. Take a newspaper, take some scissors, choose from this paper an article. Next, carefully cut out each of the words that make up this article and put them all together in a bag. Shake gently. Next, take out each cutting one after the other. Copy conscientiously in the order in which they left the bag. OK. Right, so tip it out. Right. So right. that's the, this is the way they've fallen out. We're updating squeaky-voiced felt. Hang on. The Cumberbatch appeared correct were cardboard catchphrases. Occasionally sometimes correct, it says. <laughs> which kind of sums up random words. Yeah. I think what they were beginning to explore was that idea that, you know, we we take so much of what we're being told for granted. We, we're seeing it as the voice of authority and and infallible. And they're saying it's not really. It's, yeah. it's just words. Thank you. Thank you. We've been recording the music video and it goes like this. I'm hardcore and I know the score and I am disgusted by the poor and my chums matter more because we are the law and I've made sure we're ready for class of war. Cut up today is such a, a prevalent hours, form. Deconstructing what you think of as true 
and and telling you it's just you know it's just an assembly of information which you could put out in another combination you know any source of any information can be cut and connected but this is a random telling. compilation yeah but yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the difference. Isn't I think it? what's happening now is people are trying to do something uh, more coherent with it. So uh, Trist, this is Tristan Zara's unpatented idea, <laughs> but it's led to fridge magnet poetry. Fridge magnet poetry, and it's led to the whole of the internet, which consists mostly of people cutting up bits of film and television. The idea that we can all re-edit. One day, this is how all programs have been made. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, thank you. <laughs> um... Dada poets and artists jumped on the creative opportunities provided by Cut Up, using the process for more than just satire. Sometimes a painting doesn't go the way you want it to go. Damn you, fine artwork! And this happened to artist Jean Arp, who was so frustrated, he ripped up the painting and let the pieces land on the floor. And where they landed, he decided that this was exactly what he wanted in the first place. It's not bad, actually. It's pretty good. And Arps wasn't too bad either. Hello. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Yes. This Dadai's principle of tearing everything up re-emerged in 60s counterculture. And nowhere more so than with William Burroughs, who made an art out of chance happenings with his fragmented poetry, tape cut-ups, and even randomly reassembled films. Hello? Yes? Where are we? Hello? Yes? Hello? Yes? Hello? Burroughs' artistic experiments would trigger a new wave of cut-up in the second half of the century, passing on his Dada's technique to musicians from Paul McCartney to David Bowie. When I've used it for more than anything else is igniting anything that might be in my imagination. I tried doing it with diaries and things and I was finding out amazing things about me and what I'd done and where, where I was going. And a lot of the things that I'd done, it, it seemed that it would predict things about the future or tell me a lot about the past. And anyway, then let's see what happens. From our pop stars to our countercultural heroes, they're all a little bit under the influence of Dada. In 1919, the Dada epidemic hit Cologne. Each time it spread, Dada mutated and evolved. Zurich Dada had introduced absurdist nonsense. Berlin Dada had targeted the political establishment, and New York Dadaists had sent up the art world. Now, in Cologne, it was all about shock for shock's sake. A Cologne publication called the Berlin Dadaists Counterfeits of Dada for the Strongly Held Beliefs. They claimed they can neither shit nor pee without ideology. What Cologne Dada lacked in politics, it made up for in anarchy. The Dada Early Spring Exhibition incensed audiences with an entrance via a public urinal of a beer hall. And on the way in, the public was showered with obscenities. Audiences were so incensed that they destroyed artworks in fits of rage. And Max Ernst, the leader of Cologne Dada, actively encouraged this destruction, displaying a sculpture with an axe attached. The police said, enough is enough and closed down the show. To find out what all this anarchy and destruction was about, I'm going to meet Michael Landy, one of the mischievous young British artists who introduced Dada's shock tactics to a new generation in the 90s. Michael is best known for destroying all of his possessions in the name of art. Hello? And judging by the look of his house, he hasn't replaced many of them since. In Cologne, Max Ernst had a 
wooden sculpture with an axe attached to it so that they oh, can yeah. destroy it. What do you know about that? Destruction in art is kind of like a long history, really. And I think Dada was like, it brought like destruction as a, it's, um, it's not, you know, it's not, not necessarily nihilistic. It can be also be creative. Yeah. Picasso talks about having like, every time he makes a painting, in a sense, it's a kind of mini destruction. You know, you've got to take things apart to, um, to like recreate in a sense. You've got to take like the previous generation apart in a sense. You've got to almost like dismiss what they do and, and kind of recreate yourself with a whole new set of values. Because you did your destruction. Yeah, I destroyed all my worldly belongings, yeah. Absolutely everything. At, at the time, yeah, at the age of 37. And how, how did you destroy it? We didn't get an axe to it or anything like that. It was actually quite a methodical way of doing it. So did you, did you destroy your artwork as well? Yeah, I destroyed my artwork. I destroyed my friend's artwork. So would you say that was a dada thing to do? Yeah, in, in some respects, yeah. I, I would say it was a pretty absurd thing to do. Yeah, and it did get up people's nose because obviously um, people work their whole lives to acquire things, don't they? Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and there I was, destroying them all. Michael Landy and his mates shocked the art world in the 90s with the notorious Sensation exhibition. There was Damien Hurst with his shark, Tracy Emin with her unmade bed, and Marcus Harvey with his portrait of serial killer Myra Hindley made with child handprints. But while Cologne Dada had its show shut down by the police, the YBAs just provoked a few headlines in the tabloids. You were involved in the Sensation show, weren't you? Oh, hands up, I was, yeah. I mean, Sensation is like a collection of Charles Sarchi's. I mean, Dada is like, they, you know, they're, like, they're, they're a group of artists who create manifestos. You know, they have like yeah. shared ideologies. I think the only similarity would be, would be the media. Dada was being more provocative than I am, and their audience is very conservative. I mean, what people think of art is like a nice landscape painting or a nice cherub in bronze. They don't think that, you know, a mannequin with a light bulb on its head is art. Yeah. So they're trying to shock people, aren't they? Yeah, they That's are. That's why they're trying to get up their noses and make them angry. Yeah. So, any final thoughts on Dada? Well, I'd just like to thank Dada, really, for paving the way for people like me to come along. Yeah. Thank you, Dada. Thank you, Dada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've brought a piece of artwork along with me for you. You, you, know, you know the history of me and artwork. We don't yeah, I know, really yeah. Know. <laughs> it's one of my prized possessions. But well, now you're making me feel bad. No, you can take right. it home. No, no. I want you to do what you've got to do with it. I could What's make you do it. Yeah. I feel much better, but have you, you have can you, follow my instructions. Have you got any ideas? Maybe show, show it to me first. So I'll go and get the plate. OK. And then we'll talk about how to destroy it. How are we going to get rid of it? Yeah, here it is. Aww. It's, a, it's a, a wedding plate for Bill and Kat, William and, you know, the royals. So the, the, the classic way, I suppose, of destroying it is the Grecian way, isn't it? Oh. I like the idea of poking it off something. OK, we could poke it off my head, top of my head. We could balance it on top of my head. Yeah. And you could and push it, it off. Uh, well, you, you know where your broom is. You've got a flat head, I'll go and get the broom. <laughs> OK, I'll try, I'll try and balance it on my head. Yeah. Right, you ready? Did that break? Yeah. Oh. There. Well, that looks nice now, I like yeah, that. Yeah, that looks nice. Yeah, I like that as well. I could sellotape that back together Are you going to sweep that up and put it in a vitrine? In a latrine? In a vitrine, yeah. A vitrine. Not, not latrine, no. That's Duchamp. Put a cloche over it. A what? A, cl <laughs> a cloche. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it then. Yeah. When I do silly things in my comedy, it's a bit of throwaway fun. But when I do them with an esteemed young British artist, I am surely creating a piece of Dadai's performance art. You find me several tenths of my way through this journey and exploration into what is Dada. I've spoken to several people, all of which seem to have varying ideas about Dada. Was it political, anarchic, was it comedy? What was it? It was probably all of those things and more. But what I can say is, since the beginning, I thought I had a quite an, a good idea of about what Dada is. I think I'm probably more confused now, so I shall continue my journey and find out what exactly is Dada. Oh!
To help me answer that question, I'm meeting the man who updated Dada's absurdist style for my generation. Now, where is he? Strangers meeting in the night. I never expected to see no. you. No. What are you Texas doing here? I don't know. What are you doing here? <laughs> I don't know. A car brought me. I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> well, Terry, what does Dada mean to you, if anything? <laughs> uh, I've never seriously thought about what it means to me. Yeah. It just is. It seems you know what me. it is? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think what was interesting was the fact that it was anti-war, it was a reaction to the war, uh, the First World War, yeah. reaction to bourgeois society and these, these um, very boring tastes. I think the anger is what's interesting about it, how they were angry about the, the world nightmare that they were living in, and yet you deal with it in different ways. And it's the humor side that you know, we always yeah. went for. Is that what it was? Or was there a war going on, so we're going to have to have fun and lighten the situation? Or, or you go absurd, you yeah. go totally absurdist. If we're in an absurd situation, a complete nightmare out there, well, let's create nightmares yeah. <laughs> and throw it back at society and see if you can shake it up. That's a really good point, because that's really what you because it was just, it was madness. Yeah. I mean, I left America because of the Vietnam War and, and all of that, and I realised I was more, da I was more Dada-esque than I realised, because completely against the war. I hated the way society was structured and behaving, and I want to make people laugh. Yeah. Ba-boom! Benedictus benedicat, periesum Christum dominum nostrum. Benedictus dicat, periesum Christum dominum nostrum. What interests me is how many artists that I've always been, you know, either copying, admiring, or being influenced by, were the Dadaists. Yeah. And George Melly wrote a review of Python, and he referred to me as you know, a, a, a product of Max Ernst. I thought, wow, I better... So you get into... Uh, so you weren't aware before? I was only aware of his paintings. I wasn't aware of his collages. This is a film by Hans Richter. Yeah. It was a Dadaist. Look at this. It's called Ghosts Before Breakfast. <laughs> that's the... <laughs> the silly walk. There it is, look, that's it, isn't it? Yep. No. So who saw that, then? Probably nobody. <laughs> <laughs> is it just a coincidence? <laughs> but that's what I love about things, how coincidental things can be. Yeah. Jesus, we were just doing it. We yeah. weren't aware of what we were doing. No, there's a bubbling pot, isn't there? Where yeah. Dadaists pop out like bubbles yeah. and they're not aware that they're <laughs> well, being no. called Dadaists. Yeah, I know. I think it was easier when we were doing Python because, well, certainly for me coming to this country, the, the categories are more clear. You know, uh, the, the bankers, city guys were in pi businessmen in yeah. um, pinstripe suits, bowler hats, working class looked like working class, the middle class was the middle class. Now it's I think it's harder to be Dadaist right now. <laughs> Maybe it's ripe for a new uprising well, of Dadaism. Th I think it's really hard to get to grips with because you can't find what the enemy is. You can't yeah. react against it because it's so atomized now. <laughs> In the early 20s, with the war over, the global outposts of Dada converged in Paris. First, Tristan Zara from Zurich, then Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray from New York. Oi, Marcel! And then, Max Ernst from Cologne. A new supergroup was formed. Paris Dada offered its groupies more spectacle and more sheer silliness than anything that had gone before. It was Dada with bells on. <laughs> By way of self-promotion, the Dadaist plastered stickers across the city.
Francis Picabia made a drawing on a blackboard and then erased it at the exhibition. And to announce the opening of a Man Ray exhibition, the space was filled with balloons and the Dadaists popped them as people came in. Paris audiences were so outraged they threw tomatoes and raw meat at them. Now I'm meeting an artist who knows exactly how it feels to be on the receiving end of groceries. Martin Creed's Turner Prize winning show, The Lights Going On and Off, which consisted of The Lights Going On and Off, invited the question, is this art? And prompted some gallery goers to throw eggs at the wall. So this is your studio? Yeah. What shows around? Yeah, yeah. well, so there's, there's, um, these are paintings. Oh yeah, so <laughs> I've heard about them. <laughs> that's a bag, that's a yeah. bag, that says, that actually says whatever. Oh yeah. So there's some boxes here. Yeah. What's this? A knitting thing with the stripes getting bigger. What's it going to be? No, that is what it is. Oh, is it? And this is a pair of trousers I've been working on. What are you going to do with them? Well, just um, <clears throat> wear them. <laughs> wow. That is a hat. How's it look? Looks good. Aye. What is that? It's a panda, Fiat Panda. <laughs> so, what about Dada? Have you got anything that's Dada esque in here? Eh, I don't, well, I don't, I don't know, but I don't, I don't know, maybe. Um, a lot of it is because I think it's um, sort of a bit stupid. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, to that's me, what that's Dada what Dada is. is. I like being stupid. But there's a political meaning, and, mm -hmm. the, and then you've got to balance that with the deftness or the stupidness. Right, I. Because I'd probably fall on the deft side. I would go, stu I think I would definitely fall You'd be on even the further. stupid side. Be even further, that's right, <laughs> the other end is deft, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because I think it's like um, more, you know, it's more like life. Because yeah. life's stupid. Yeah. Like the Dadaists, Martin filled the gallery half full with balloons. His works are starting to feel rather familiar. That was your idea, wasn't it? Balloons. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about that when well, I Well, I know, but this, this is what I've been finding. The Dadaists did have a lot of ideas for the first time. Yeah, it looks like it, I. And, um,. And then you add them later. Right. <laughs> I'm just wandering about here. Yeah. I mean, who knows what they were really trying to do, those people? I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't. No, I don't know either. But I... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, there we are then. That's the answer to that, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Is there any reason behind any of your stuff? Maybe it's like trying to do what you're not supposed to do. You know, I did this film of people being sick. Yeah. And one of people shitting as well. And just because it's a taboo of, yeah. of um, our, like, of British society. And are you allowed to go into um, a gallery and, and laugh your head off? Yeah, well, did I? Well, I would have thought so, I. Well, that's what I encourage whenever I have my shows. <laughs> Martin's invited me to join him in his latest nonsensical idea, blind painting. So, I'm going to do a portrait with absolutely no idea what it's going to look like. Oh, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> it's weird. I think I've done. Yeah, I think I have. All right. So we're gonna. What we're gonna do is just show. Them do I? Okay. Whoa! Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my god. That's, oh, it's dripping. Put them down on here. I don't want it to drip. Amazing. 
So has this got anything to do with Dada? I suppose it's just it's a new idea. Maybe because it's like trying to do the way you're not supposed to do it. Because you think that if you're going to do a picture or something, you should. So it's getting rid of all conventions. Look at what isn't you're. It? I feel like you know if you try and control things, it doesn't necessarily make them better. Yeah. You know. This has got no bearing on anything. <laughs> In Paris, Tristan Zara achieved his dream by gathering together all the Dadaists to form a movement. Mouvement Dada. It was the culmination of all the nonsense of Dada. And for a brief moment, Dada was the talk of the town. But for some, like Max Ernst and Man Ray, the nonsense was wearing thin. They'd begun searching for meaning through dreams and the subconscious. Man Ray famously took a metronome, cut out an eye from a photograph, put them together and made a new work, Object to be Destroyed. I think I might have a go myself. Connect and print, is that what I do? Enter the password. Should have a little bit of light music on. There's something slowly happening. Then he cut out an eye. And then he stuck the eye on the metronome. And there he had a new work, object to be destroyed. So, with all the Dadaists all going off in different directions, there was nothing holding this movement together. And what's more, egos were taking over. So, Tristan Zara, right, he wanted to be the leader of the Dadaists. So, look at me, I want to be the king of the Dadaists. In fact, they used to call him Zara Tristan. But soon, Zara had rivals in the Paris art world, including the French poet André Breton, and he was getting up the noses of other poets as well, like Paul Eluard. Dada was about to reach its bitter end in July 1923 at the Soiree of the Bearded Heart. So early on in the evening, André Breton takes offence at some performer and whacks him with his cane and gets thrown out. Then a bit later on, just before Tristan Zara's play, a gas heart is on. There's like a rumpus going on in the stalls. It's like, you know, then, who is it? It's Paul Eluard, the poet. He demands to see Tristan Zara. So Tristan Zara comes out, they have a pushing and shoving match, and then Paul Eluard lamps Tristan Zara. He goes down. And that was it, you know, it was kind of all over by then, really. So we went off to the boozer to talk about it and had a right old laugh. Dada had died a death. But some Dadaists, like Max Ernst and Man Ray, found another gang to join, jumping ship to André Breton's new art movement, Surrealism. But I don't know if anyone really, really and honestly knew what Dada was all about yet. And to be honest, neither do I. But perhaps if I look out on this historic city, take in its atmosphere, I might get a feel for Dada and finally get to grips with this contradictory movement. No, Paris didn't do much for Dadaism. And to be honest, it's not doing a lot for me either. I'm off. Terry! Terry! What, what is Dada? What is, no, come on, what is Dada? Leave me alone. Leave what is, me alone. What is it? What is Dada? I'm not going to tell him. I'm not going to tell him. What is Dada? Everyone needs a shed to go to when all else has failed. What is Dada? What is Dada? What is Dada? Hey, what do you reckon? Turkey. Tutankhamun. Hello? What? 
Moon River, wider than a mile. Hello? Hello? Yes, Arthur Smith, at your service here. What exactly is Dada? Dada is a virgin microbe that fills up all the space that reason cannot with its convention. Good. I'm glad you sorted that out for me then. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, it, it, you know, if you start trying to analyse it, then you'll end up disappearing up your own bottom and it recognises that. So, um, s some people reckon it's political, some people think it's just stupid, absurdist comedy. Or is it all of it? What is it? You've got to defy convention and logic in order to amaze and stimulate people, I suppose. Dada gave a licence for people to be stupid, and in some sense it is the founder of modern comedy. And you've definitely acted on your licence to be stupid, uh, Jim <laughs> and Vic, and all your mates. So well done. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm stuck here alone in my bar, and you're stuck there alone in your bar, and yet we're together, Jim. That's a kind of Dadaism all by itself. That's beautiful. Right. Where do I go from here? We're nearly at the end of our voyage, and have we discovered anything? Yes, I think we have. I think we know a little bit more about Dada. Do you know more about Dada? Do I know more about Dada? I do, but do you? I don't, and you do. And I think one thing that we have learned is that a bloke from the BBC, that's me, sitting on a pedestal, can't tell you what to think. They'll put it all together in the edit anyway. Dada is completely maverick. Deconstructing the serious uh, idea about art. <laughs> it's just an assembly of artists who create art that was incredibly modern. It's very coincidental. Freeform. Negligence. <laughs> They're a bit stupid and want to make people laugh. The spirit of Dada was about a whole new set of extraordinary ideologies. They were angry about convention and people being sick. It's like a big political shake it up. I would say it's pretty absurd. It just is. More like life. Nonsensical anyway. More provocative. Than beer and sausages. I'm sure it's something like that. Thank you.